Okay, our next talk this morning is going to be on the Steam Controller, and it'll be by Eric Hope and John McCaskey from Valve. The first question we should probably get through is why. Why did we go to all the trouble of manufacturing and supporting a custom controller just for Steam? The Steam Controller, Valve's very own flagship hardware product, Produced for the very goal of giving control of the PC and anything that you can do on one. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm James Manicki. Visual entertainment is something that I'm very passionate about, but another thing I'm very passionate about is the Steam controller and the support that it currently has. I got this controller for Christmas, the year that it came out, and I've been using it the majority of the time I've been using my PC ever since, so it's probably upwards of 500 to 1000 hours or something. My exposure to the Steam controller goes beyond personal use. I created the Steam Controller Discord chat, and I've had the opportunity to meet and speak to people such as Lars Doucet, the developer of Defender's Quest, and a few people from Valve, one of them being Pierre Lugrify, and another being Scott Dalton. I've been making videos on the Steam Controller software. I know a lot of you are weirded out or having trouble stomaching this device, or even learning how to use it well, but this device is one of the most revolutionary products that has ever been released for video games. A controller typically gets bashed online because it's doing nothing but different things in every single area that what most of us are used to. But the things that this device are doing for input as of right now and through its community of users for learning how to use it and do things with it, this has proven to be just as important as the virtual reality movement. The way people play video games and control things is going through a revolution with this controller, and you can get one of these for a very reasonable price. Modern controllers and game consoles today mostly use the very same conventional forms of input that have been around ever since the original PlayStation, when Sony released the DualShock controller. Two analog sticks, two buttons for your fingers, and a collection of four face buttons, usually two in the middle, plus a home button, and a D-pad. This controller came out in 1998. There have been a few adjustments to this formula over the years, but barely anything's really changed for it's popular for most consumers and developers to utilize. So in these aspects, the Steam Controller looks like a black sheep. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. Why change something that works? You can't reinvent the wheel, but maybe these aren't the wheel. Maybe these could use some major improvements or change. For years, PC gamers have wanted to play their games on the couch. The home computer has served its primary purposes for the past 30 years at the desk. The desk is a great place to use the computer, However, having the option and capability to use a computer and use it just as well on a more comfortable piece of furniture where you can lay down or sit next to close friends or loved ones, playing games or doing whatever you'd like, is something that I can't help but very few would be opposed to. Computers themselves are jack of all trades types of devices. You can use it to play games. You can use it to do projects or assignments. You can use it to enjoy watching movies and video content. There is no need to purchase secondary devices or other options if you already own one. Ever since PC gaming caught on, games made in this space directly involving interaction with a mouse have either had a hard time transitioning the conventional controller inputs, or have given consumers a great challenge. And PC gamers who wish to play titles or genre on a console are also greeted with a major challenge. Let's list some examples here. Dual analog sticks never remedied Roller Coaster Tycoon on the Xbox, and the game was overall very difficult to play since, well, you are navigating a small mouse with an analog stick. Movement was very slow, and while it's playable, it isn't exactly the most satisfying way to enjoy the game. The same can be said about StarCraft on the Nintendo 64, as you can't play the game nearly as proficiently and fast as what you'd be capable of with an actual mouse. Command & Conquer Red Alert 3 and the Xbox 360 faced similar challenges. Even though it used techniques to help make the experience easier for analog sticks, you're still being held back by the analog sticks for controlling the cursor. Modern console shooters are the best example for the case of difficulty typical PC gamers are posed with when making the transition from their desks to their couch. This delves into the argument of accuracy between using analog sticks and mice for aiming. No matter how much fine tuning is put into an analog stick, it will never be as accurate as having the full dexterity and precision of a mouse because mouse aiming is dictated by your arms and wrist movement. You can adjust the speed and sensitivity, but this makes it harder to keep your target with an analog stick since your thumb is relying on a pivot with very skewed sensitivity for your control. So PC gamers are greeted with challenges in accuracy. Modern game controllers are the centerpieces for their platforms, 
Every bit of possible consumer judgment and interest is put upon them, and because there is so much pressure in this realm, that is why there hasn't been much change since the original DualShock controller. So no matter how many benefits there are, Sony and Microsoft are scared to take the risk of going from this to this. Popular shooters like Call of Duty rely on sacrificing your aiming or movement with the analog sticks for functions such as jumping, picking up or activating items, and whatever else. And while on the PC spectrum you don't need to make the sacrifice of taking away your movement and camera to do actions, you typically have to reach your fingers to do these actions, which can be an incredibly overwhelming experience for console gamers making the transition. So since analog sticks and button placements on modern game controllers have given challenges to even those who play on the platforms, there have been peripherals and tools, tweaks to try to elevate the curve at which they can play. And likewise on the PC spectrum. But in the end, your controller looks like an overwhelming contraption that relies on bells and whistles to accomplish things that your hands should be able to provide without spending the extra money after making the purchase on something that should have already done the job efficiently for your needs. So now that we have all of the issues and challenges out of the way, that's where the Steam Controller comes in. Designed as a jack of all trades device made for the effect of delivering mouse accurate and flexible gameplay options for PC gamers who wish to play games on their couch, the Steam Controller is the marriage of what makes both controller and mouse inputs great. But the Steam Controller is not the first of its kind. Due to my passion I've done a fair amount of research on the subject, and I find it important to get into the history of what led to the creation of this device and Valve's movement into making hardware. So let's dive in. The first thing that we need to touch on, hardware, physical items, phones, TVs, tablets, software, the stuff that you use on hardware. Now some of you might be asking, what's Steam? Steam is the largest distributor for video games on the computer. Created by Valve, a critically acclaimed and beloved video game developer that has been around since 1996, responsible for many famous titles such as Portal, Left 4 Dead, and Half-Life. Steam came into the world when they shipped Half-Life 2 and Counter-Strike Source in 2004. Over time, Steam has grown into now being the Xbox Live for computer gamers, and one of the most popular places to buy and play video games in the world. Now that we got that out of the way, let's dive into trackballs. The trackball was invented for military purposes in the 1940s by Ralph Benjamin. Over time, and once computers started finding more efficient use in consumer and office environments in the late 80s, companies such as Logitech started adapting the technology. In the early 90s, a company called Triax released the TurboTouch 360 controller for Sega and Nintendo consoles at the time. This controller used a touch-based D-pad where it used taps or swipes instead of using button presses, and it wasn't very well received, making it in the top 10 list in IGN's worst controllers. In 1996, Bandai, a company mostly known for making Gundam, Power Rangers, and various other Saban Children's TV shows toy products, and even their own portable video game console, the Wonder Swan, which was kind of like a Game Boy but a bit less popular. They teamed up with Apple to create what was called the Pippin. The Pippin was a video game console, but what made it interesting and set it apart from anything else at the time is that it used PC environmental norms. The back of it had ports for popular PC peripherals at the time, such as a printer and even internet connectivity. It was not just a game console, but also a living room computer, or what the internet likes to call a home theater personal computer an HTPC, a computer shaped in console-sized form factor. The controller was shaped like a boomerang, but what makes this even more interesting is that it utilized a trackball as input, and it was shaped so your thumbs would reach in specific areas. Apple beat Microsoft by five years before they got into the console market. Now while trackballs have been around for a while at this time, the Apple Pippin's controller was the first controller of this type of shape catered to two hands with grips to use a trackball. And the main decision for this trackball's implementation is for users to properly navigate the console's desktop. We're taking a look at trackballs because in the past, Valve's early prototypes for the Steam controller involved, well, trackballs. A few years later, during the development of the GameCube, Nintendo tried experimenting with trackballs in their controllers as well. Not much was brought to fruition from this design. In 2005, Sony unveiled the controller for the PlayStation 3. Looking very similar to the Pippins, the design was eventually dropped in favor of the traditional DualShock design. And dating back to at least 2006, 
An unconventional new controller for the PC was making some buzz around YouTube and news stations everywhere. I mean, it's called Alpha Grip. It combines a lot of functionality into a small amount of space. You can type away from almost any position, no longer restricted by a keyboard. The main jar of this controller is using it to type without the common types of chronic hand pain associated with office spaces and typical business environments among other things. A reinvention of using the keyboard to type, but it was also an entirely revolutionary way to navigate and use a computer. Michael Wilner, the creator of AlphaGrip's iGrip controller, very clearly felt really passionate about it and felt it had a lot of potential for anyone who uses a PC. Right here you can see on Alphagrip's website, the first thing that you see is a photo of a user playing World of Warcraft on their television in their living room. This is the boldest statement that could ever be made for this controller. In a lot of ways, this is the precursor to the Steam controller. Inside Valve, they've tested and hacked away at various different controllers, input devices, and parts during the creation of the Steam controller. Here you can see they had an alpha grip eye grip right there in their office, so they clearly saw the benefits that the device had and it definitely drew a lot of inspiration for Valve. But the biggest detractor to the alpha grip eye grip is that it has an overwhelming amount of buttons on it, a sea of buttons, if you will. Also in 2006, the Nintendo Wii and PlayStation 3 both made the release, both consoles offering controllers that have motion controls in them. A bold move that has never been properly executed, and garnering a bold move from Nintendo, basing their entire system around this input method, after the past 23 years of their home consoles being mostly catered to their controllers having traditional, straightforward forms of input. And throughout the years, quite a few other controllers had a similar idea to the Alpha Grip Eye Grip. And now let's go back a little bit. The Nintendo GameCube keyboard controller for Fantasy Star Online was made to be used for proper dual usage of quick and reliable communication in-game, as well as giving users the proper way to play and experience the game with a controller input. But overall, the design came out looking extremely silly and impractical, and a lot of people's first impression of it to this day is that it's some sort of strange Photoshop joke. And from 2010 all the way up to 2014, there have been some wild creations that have quite a lot in common with the Alpha Grip and an Xbox 360 controller, both merged in one. In 2011, with partnership with Sixth Sense, Razer released the Hydra, two wired split controllers made for both hands, very similar and comparable to the PlayStation Move and the Nintendo Wii's Wiimote and Nunchuck, but this was only for the PC. What's made even more interesting and notable about the Hydra's release is that Valve implemented support for the Hydra controllers in their own game. Portal 2. At the time, this was a standout decision that Valve decided to make to add support for a niche third-party controller, as the only forms of input Valve has ever offered beyond the mouse and keyboard support in their games was X input, or support for Xbox 360 controllers in their games on the PC. Never before has any other device gotten this type of special treatment and catering that Valve decided to give to the Hydra. This is the first widespread public showing as well as their use of their interest in motion controls and dual controllers. In 2012, a campaign on Kickstarter for a product called the Revolve Controller for the PlayStation 3 rolled out, a controller that has long been in production since 2005. This device boasts of the convenience and attractiveness of having a trackball to aim with games, particularly shooters on a game console. While this device is strictly made just for video games, much like Valve, its creator is connected to a game designer and actively working with them on the controller. As of early 2017, the project has yet to hit market, however, it's apparently been very close. In 2012, the public started to hear rumors that Valve was creating a game console. At this time, Valve was still actively releasing game titles, with Counter-Strike Global Offensive and Dota 2 both being beta tested, and the Steam Store was mostly selling games made by large expensive companies only a short while before they wound up releasing the floodgates and letting anybody publish their game with Steam. The overall tone and idea of Valve making their own game console felt very interesting, very strange, and pretty refreshing compared to the two major consoles that were dominating the market at the time. Kotaku published an article displaying that they discovered that Valve owed its patents for hardware. These patents were filed dating back to 2009. This was merely just a short year after the Alpha Grip I Grip saw its consumer release. Before we go further, we need to take a look at the origins of how after 13 years of game and software development, Valve wanted to make their own controller and hardware. And why exactly does Valve want to enter the console market if they are based on the PC platform? 
Meet Scott Dalton, a man who used to mod Quake levels, and when hired for Valve, participated in the design of the levels of Half-Life 2 and various other projects, as well as their special effects. He is also a fan of home theater computers. I'm a person that has, a, has always had a home theater PC hooked up at home. A very early adopter for all of our internal big picture and SteamOS testing at home. And I've always been one of the person that was always trying to find, how do I play this game that's this awesome PC game on my couch? So you had so a lot I, of terrible wireless I was the, keyboards with Yeah, heads. yeah, I, I tried every random thing that I could find. After diving in with full attempts at using his PC efficiently on his couch and meeting frustration doing so, he is one of the main driving forces behind Valve to make their own game controller. Ben Krasnow, an incredibly gifted, intelligent designer with a YouTube channel that has documented some of his wild experiments. His LinkedIn states that he helped form the hardware team at Valve when they decided to go all in in 2011. Eurogamer and IGN featured some videos from his channel from early 2013, showing that he was working on controller devices. One of these was one for the mouth, where you place this retainer looking thing on the roof of your mouth and swipe with your tongue for mouse movement. The other video shows him with a butt controller, made with a weight scale, where you can use it for movement in your games. Both accessories made mine for the handicapped, and with similar mindset involved as the Steam controller, for usage in controlling PC games and environments in new and different ways. Jeff Bellinghausen, he moved to Valve in 2012 after working at Six Sense, a company which today specializes in virtual reality. But what's interesting is that Jeff and Six Sense had developed the Hydra. We licensed our motion tracking technology to Razer, and in 2011, they released the Hydra with two wired controllers. Today, Six Sense is focusing on STEM, a controller system for virtual reality that tracks body movement, praised by one of 3D gaming's pioneers and Oculus's own John Carmack. I don't think I've ever really been impressed by a controller. But the, the Sixth Sense stuff, I was impressed with. Sam Lentinga, known by many online as Slukin. After having involvement with creating SDL and a history as former lead software engineer at Blizzard Entertainment, known for hit titles such as World of Warcraft, Hearthstone, and Overwatch, he arrived at Valve in 2012. Pierre Lucrify, aka Plague Man. A gifted programmer actively involved in the steps forward with virtual reality, open source projects, and redesigning controllers. He was brought into Valve between 2008 and 2012. Greg Coomer, a longtime member of Valve from its early days, and before then, a former employee at Microsoft and Nintendo. He feels passionate and determined enough in living room computers to be behind this initiative. Eric Hope and John McCaskey. Both employees who've been with Valve for over seven years or more. Eric Hope, a former designer for Apple, as made obvious here. John McCaskey, a very versatile programmer with his hands in the design of Steam in what would become Steam's big picture mode. And last but not least, Jerry Ellsworth, a very interesting creator who has much in common with Ben Krasnow and also has a YouTube channel showing some of her wild creations and controller experiments. She came to the hardware team in 2011. All of these extremely talented, experienced individuals were brought together to participate in taking Valve into the mysterious, risky next step of producing its very own hardware. The driving factor behind this team coming together was to bring Steam to the living room, which is something that users were asking for for a very long time. This initiative would involve Steam machines, an operating system, the Steam Controller, streaming methods and streaming hardware with the Steam Link, and methods and ways to navigate the Steam Library and play games while a great distance away from the TV. According to Greg Coomer in Stuff's 2013 article, How Valve Built the Steam Controller, At first, our goal for our input device wasn't all that clear. We were doing some experiments on wearable computing and virtual reality, but for the living room, we needed an input device that was able to play the whole Steam catalog without requiring somebody to bring a mouse and keyboard onto the sofa with it. So we looked at what PC gaming uses by default, and of course, that's a mouse and keyboard. The early days of the Steam controller's development involved filing the patents for the controller. The Steam controller that they have on this patent hasn't been seen in the public past conceptualization. As you can imagine, you probably don't want to take the 100 plus keys of a keyboard and just shove them onto a controller. I think some products have tried. Valve definitely spent a lot of time with AlphaGrip's iGrip, 
seeing where they can improve and what they can change. But the controller team realized something, which is that there are no games in the PC that need to use every single button on the keyboard at once. Therefore, there is no need to involve that many buttons, especially if the device is given proper software, it can do as many functions as the user wants. Fine. Um, and I early on was taking like you know gamepad controllers and taking trackballs and wiring them all together and, and hacking now all the interfaces to make it work. When he says controllers, he means these guys. And controller support on the PC has a long history of being well challenging to say the least. Microsoft has a long history of introducing standardizations on the PC. For a decade, from 1995 to 2005, the most common form of using controllers on a PC was through Microsoft's own Direct Input API. An API, Application Programming Interface, aka software tools that lets you interact with the hardware. Direct Input, or D-Input for short, was very useful for a multitude of devices such as steering wheels, joysticks, and controllers made for the PC among other things. This input method has its fallacies, but overall it was pretty alright for its time and offers support for up to 128 buttons on a single device. In 2005, Microsoft shipped X input close to the same time as when they released the Xbox 360 console. This meant that if games were to use this API, then it would feature everything for the controller that this game would if it was released on an Xbox 360 console. This would include button icons, or glyphs for short, vibration, and complete proficient use of the controller without having to interact with the game or even touch a mouse and keyboard to properly set it up or use it from the get-go. X input will become a very popular standardized feature in most released PC games. While this can be seen as good since it seems like finally more games on the PC are supporting controllers, showing proper icons, and that you fully utilize the Xbox 360 controller, this trapped controller input on the PC for years to be stuck to just working around X input which meant that they would only have support for Xbox controllers. No love for these guys. Because more games were being developed with controller support on the PC and consoles were becoming more popular with the seventh generation of consoles, that meant that people who owned or knew someone who had one of these systems would probably want to try their controllers on their old PC, or maybe they made the transition to PC gaming and they want to use their console's controller since it's familiar to them. Now here's where more problems come in. The only way you could plug and play was if you had the wired only USB Xbox 360 controller. There is no way to just plug and play the wireless controllers. You can't even use it when it's plugged in through USB. You would have to buy a $20 adapter to plug into your PC to use it. And since there was no support for these guys in the PC, this resulted in several things. Xpatter, Pinnacle, and Input Mapper have offered software support for controller devices that don't have native support on the PC, allowing these devices as well as the Xbox 360 controllers to do anything that you'd want them to do. You can control your desktop with your controller, play games it wasn't designed for, and most importantly, make your computer see these as this. But this doesn't mean that these methods are completely reliable. Because so many PC games are so diverse in their control schemes, and customization and control over what parts function as what players want, as Xpatter, Pinnacle, and Input Mapper have proven. Valve's controller would be made to function with their own created software for it. So the team at Valve collaborated and dived in, and after research, development, and experimentation, came down to this device. What looks like a mix of a Razer Hydra and an Xbox 360 controller, this is the first Steam controller prototype. According to Pierre Lugrify himself, it's nothing more than a shape experiment involving the carcass of an Xbox 360 controller with stuff hot glued to it. This device could be separated for use in both hands, spread far apart, and merged together as one, using magnets on the sides to connect them together. And this harkens back to Valve's interest in split controllers, from the previously mentioned support for the Razer Hydra controllers in Portal 2. And who can blame them when the idea seems so convenient and is much more popularized today? Their next developments involved more shape experiments with devices in single shapes that don't split, like common game controllers. These devices made use of trackballs for mouse control, inspired by the aforementioned controllers, with them being delegated to the right side. Many shape experiments later led them to the Alex model, a functioning working prototype controller. The issue that they found with trackballs was that dust, sweat, and dirt, among other things, would find their ways on the inside of the device and would also interfere with the signal. In addition to this, having just a trackball as input felt too limiting to them. 
So the team researched, obtained, and experimented with trackpads and with creating proper software for them. Amazed and super enthused at their experiments and tests, they realized that they could emulate trackballs with them extremely well by having software give the trackpad a virtual trackball area. Contrary to laptop trackpads and typical touch forms of input, the technology they used and packed into these controllers utilized haptic touch feedback, vibration wherever you touch it. Excited at the functionality of trackpads, they created a non-functioning shape experiment that would utilize nothing but trackpads. This seemed like the perfect idea. This in parity with trackpads, plus their amazing software team, means that they could pretty much do anything that they wanted with the trackpads. Things like delegate certain areas to be specific buttons, customize how many buttons there are, custom menus, and analog stick emulation. However, they realized there are massive cons to having nothing but touch-based input. With that much open space, no matter what they did and how much haptic feedback was produced, they discovered that there are benefits to having committed areas for just trackpads and that when learning how to use the device, players will find the need for specific physical responses from buttons that they can look at on the device. So that led to more experimental designs, leading to the Bastille working prototype. The next steps they took in addition to adding face buttons were how to make it so when the controller is held, players have the most amount of comfort and control they can possibly have. This led to very large grips, similar in design to Alpha Grip's eye grip, where they fill the palms and with an upwards angle, so the thumbs are directed towards the trackpads and rest with their tips. In the fall of 2012, Steam released Big Picture Mode, an interface inspired by modern game consoles and made with controllers in mind. It made accessing the store, the Steam games library, community, and friends lists all a breeze with direct input and Xbox 360 controllers. The interface is completely catered to Xbox icons and graphics, and Steam's web browser also became navigable with a controller, using what they called first-person controls, where the mouse is an always stationary crosshair, and when you navigate web pages with the analog sticks, you're moving the web page around the screen. This control scheme is very much inspired by real-time strategy games that came out in recent years at the time, such as Command & Conquer Red Alert 3 and Halo Wars on the Xbox 360. Also included was a brand new typing method for controllers called the daisy wheel. This made it so when you access text boxes and websites or on your friends list in big picture mode, the left analog stick would be able to navigate to areas where the A, B, X, Y buttons would act as letters, numbers, symbols, and later on emojis. Big picture mode quickly became adopted by HTPC users as there has never been an interface made to make playing PC games and exploring the internet so convenient with a controller. The only means for completely navigating their computers from the couch for years were very seldom and far in between. Such options included XBMC, which later on became Kodi, Windows Media Center, and Plex, among various others. But big picture mode came with its criticisms. When it was added into Steam, it was accessed by clicking a relatively large box that was located in the top right of the window where most users go to minimize or close out of. So naturally these users would accidentally launch into big picture mode without having any clue what they just did and what just happened, and do all they can to close out of it instantly since it's not the Steam that they are used to. The interface also bothered a lot of users who did use it and enjoy it, as it showed very little and gave much to be desired. In late 2012, Nintendo released the Wii U a console that offered two new controllers from Nintendo, the Wii U Pro Controller and the Wii U's Gamepad. While the Wii U Pro Controller closely resembles an Xbox 360 controller, the Wii U Gamepad features a giant touchscreen that can be used to show the game you are playing or function as a second screen with its own functions depending on that game. Also featured were a microphone, speakers, a headphone jack, and a stylus that can be pulled out of the back of it for the touchscreen. It also featured a motion bar so you could use the Wiimote by pointing at it. It can also function as a TV remote too. So following the rumors and articles online about Valve making a console, in early 2013 at CES, Valve was with a company called XI3. For the first time, Valve was publicly stating and showing that yes, they're working at what at the time and fittingly so, was a PC-based console called the Steambox. XI3 showcasing their product with Valve titled the Piston, a tiny computer that can upgrade parts, is the size of a fist, and packs a lot of power behind it for the size. It's also pretty durable too. So following this, Microsoft revealed the Xbox One and Sony unveiled the PlayStation 4, both devices including controllers very similar to the ones from their previous consoles. The direction Sony took with the PlayStation 4's DualShock 4 controller felt very fresh and welcome compared to their past history of mostly recycling the original DualShock, although many expressed their concerns as it featured a trackpad that can function as one whole button or as two individual ones, and a share button meant for just 
sharing stuff. It also included a headphone jack that can put game audio into any pair of headphones or earbuds. Back at Valve, eventually the controller team came down to the Chell model, featured are four buttons in the center, and in September 2013, they finally publicly revealed the Steam controller. Jeff Bellinghausen demonstrates the controller in use, boldly starting off the demo with Portal 2 gameplay and showing Civilization V in Papers, Please being played with it, all extremely efficiently. Shortly after this, Valve publicly announced that 300 participants could join a Steam Machine and Steam Controller beta test. Upon this announcement was the reveal Valve Steam Machine, which was nothing more than a custom-built PC with small form factor parts that anyone could purchase or build with. What makes it stand out is that it features a very unique and a very small computer case. For the beta test, Valve would ship both products to you for free, as well as Steam OS on the Steam Machine, with the only catch being to provide some feedback. The computer case for Valve Steam Machine was extremely influential in HTPC internet communities as well as computer case manufacturers and practically sparked more movement towards people designing and building smaller computers with similar parts that tower-sized computers have in them. In November, Steam also debuted the in-home streaming feature, allowing users the option to use their PC from another computer in their Wi-Fi network, a feature that would later dictate another of Valve's hardware productions. After Steam Dev Days in 2014, Valve showed an update to the Steam controller. A new working prototype titled Dog, it featured ABXY buttons very similar in design to the Xbox 360s and with two buttons in the middle, a home button, and four directional buttons. The addition of the ABXY buttons in this location and with this color scheme was because of the importance in users learning how to use the controller as well as proper function. Plus since X input dominated controller support in PC games since 2005, Having buttons that match those icons can help users out. The model that was displayed in photos up to this point featured a touchscreen, but in interviews and during Steam Dev Days, Valve stated that the four middle buttons on the Chell functioned as what the digital touchscreen would have. But they abandoned featuring the screen as it was largely unnecessary, since all the functions they would offer a user could see on their TV or monitor, and requiring moving your eyes away from what should be in focus was proven to not be very wise. So then came the Eli working prototype, which replaced the trackpad with an analog stick in its place. Don't worry, the left trackpad doesn't function, it's just there to keep away from showing the inside of the darn thing. After Eli came Freeman, replacing the four directional buttons with an analog stick very similar to the PlayStation 4s. Then came Gordon. The following year, 2015, they featured what they were calling the final Steam controller that was shipped to market later that year. This controller featured an analog stick and took away the outer rings and the track pads, and adding an indented D-pad fixture on the left pad. Along with that, they debuted the Steam Link and their virtual reality headset endeavor, the HTC Vive, with its controllers. These controllers off the bat have very remarkable similarities to the Steam controller, particularly with its trackpads. As this image shows, their testing into controlling virtual reality originally started with the Steam controller. After their interest in dual controllers with the Steam controller and the Razer Hydra, I think the Steam controller test was merely to look for immersion, which could probably best be found through its trackpads and motion capabilities, because the eventual result wound up being exactly two dual controllers for both hands. They revealed the Steam machines that would ship to market too. From PC building enthusiasts, these were instantly frowned upon as their pricing, model variety, and hardware weren't at a favorable presentation for consumers. And none of them were anything like the one Valve sent out to 300 beta testers in the fall of 2013. And while XI3's piston was shown with Valve at CES 2013, the piston wasn't one of the Steam machines being launched later in 2015. However, it is available for purchase on their website today. But the audience that has participated in vocal disapproval of these Steam machines made their opinions known, and as of early 2017, they still continue to. In the fall of 2015, Steam machines made the release, as well as the Steam Link, and the Steam controller shipped from Valve to the most popular outlets and reviewers and YouTube personalities on the internet. This resulted in an onslaught of negativity and the first impressions of these people misunderstanding how to properly use the device and giving it a large amount of poor reviews. They said that these things are good for FPSs, so we're gonna test that theory right now. My first time using it. The Steam Controller is weird. My very own Steam Controller. But in reality, it fails to do anything well. This controller is not, it's not working. It does look like a sad Darth Vader. It felt kind of cheap. How am I supposed to press the jump button while I'm looking around? Let's try that again 
with the D-pad. The Steam controller feels like a cheap gamepad you buy to play games on your iPad. Like the, I'm five and 14. Come on. Is that normal? I don't know how they came to this. Is that normal? None of the other inputs amazed me in terms of their feel. Valve, it's weird. No, it's not. It's just not doing it. It's not doing it. You do this, you put your finger here, you move up into there, and it didn't do it. Didn't do it. Did that time. Didn't do it. Bar.